Welcome family. Thank you for joining the Movement for Black Lives. This is our Fixed Clemency Act teach-in. Many of you know that the Movement for Black Lives has launched the Breathe Campaign, which came out of our 2020 Juneteenth multi-layered uprising, where we made calls for people to take to the street, but also to the city halls, to state Capitol Hills, and to Capitol Hill. And the Breathe Act was a legislative love letter to our people and to our organizations, pulling all of our demands into one piece of broad federal legislation our demands to invest in our communities, our demand to invest in our health and safety, and our demand to divest from mass incarceration, mass criminalization, and policing. So welcome. We want you to know about the Fixed Clemency Act because it is a component of our BREATHE framework. We created new pieces of legislation when we wrote Breathe, and we also curated and pulled together some amazing pieces of legislation that champions were already working on that helped us advance our abolitionist goals. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We are just honored today to be joined by activists, on the ground, activists on the local and state level, and of course, our champions on Cap Capitol Hill as we work to release our family members and our loved ones uh, from mass incarceration, from the carceral system. And today we're particularly talking about people who qualify for clemency. And we're gonna be talking about parole justice on the state level and so much more and how this all ties together to bring mostly our elders home, but all kinds of folks who are really primed for clemency. We are joined today by the, the amazing, by the champion on so many of our issues, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley of the 7th District in Massachusetts. Welcome, thank you for being here. It's wonderful to be with you. And you know, we, we wanna teach our, our members in the Movement for Black Lives and all of our followers about this amazing piece of legislation that you are pushing and that we are supporting and flanking called the Fixed Clemency Act. But before we get into the particulars of the legislation, we wanna know why, you know, why is this important, not just to you, but also to your community? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Monifa. And, and uh, before uh, getting into that, let me just um, frame my participation a little bit here today and then also uh, give some effusive uh, phrase, uh, praise and uh, verbal bouquet uh, to, to my siblings in the movement here. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's teaching to discuss a topic of a really undeniable import, and that is uh, clemency. Um, but first, I must start by recognizing the steadfast dedication and really the exhaustive leadership of the Movement for Black Lives and the work of Black liberation. As justice seekers, as table shakers, as truth tellers, this movement has not only organized to disrupt an unjust status quo, but also to advance policy solutions that center the humanity and the dignity of the very folks that have been systematically neglected and excluded. By organizing at the grassroots level, we have the power to affect change, to create a just and equitable society, one that guarantees that every person has the tools and the resources to live healthy and full lives. So organizing works, as our uh, other sibling in the movement, Latasha Brown, reminds us, organized power is realized power. And I think it's important um, uh, to lift up victories uh, when they happen, because they often try to um, you know, erase movement victories. And um, we need to take stock of those things because that fortifies and emboldens us in this work. And so I think the recent news out of the administration is really proof of the power of your voices and of this movement for black lives. President Biden announced over 75 people will receive federal clemency. And I'm grateful to be partners with you, Monifa and the entire movement for black lives. Uh, everyone involved in, in, in this broader ecosystem, uh, in this fight, you know, policy is my love language. And I say that because it has policy that has very precisely uh, exacted great hurt and harm uh, onto black folk. And um, the way that we do harm reduction and chart a different path forward is through policy. And so I'm really excited for today's teaching on the Fixed Clemency Act. But I just gotta just hold space for that. You know, this 75 people, 
75 loved ones, 75 family members. This is uh, more than uh, any uh, prior administration uh, wow. has granted clemency at this time in the, um, you know, in their, in their tenure. So right. that has right. everything to do with the vigilance uh, of this movement. So we just have to keep uh, banging the, banging the drum until our, our loved ones are home. Thank you so much for that. And what we saw, the action that we saw President Biden take um, had everything to do with organizing on the ground and also the ability that that organizing has created by putting people like you and now, of course, many other members of Congress who are really in there accountable back to our communities, accountable to our movement. I mean, it's a powerful time. I think that prior to this, it was very difficult, you know, because our members in Congress were the intermediaries. Um, it's where we go to push policy. Uh, it's where we even go to put pressure on the White House. So thank you for thanking us, but also thank you, you know, for stepping into this moment and taking this leadership. Well, this is a teaching on the Fixed Clemency Act, and a lot of folks who are watching have loved ones who are incarcerated, or they are members of organizations that want to figure out how to maybe replicate this on the state level or support this piece of federal legislation. So can you give us an overview? What is the Fixed Clemency Act, and what is clemency? Sure. Um, well, again, I'll do some uh, historic um, contextualizing here. I think to best understand the importance of clemency, we have to discuss the problem of the criminal legal system uh, right. in the status quo. So, you know, mass incarceration, we know, is nothing more than a miscarriage of justice rooted in slavery and white supremacy that has ravaged our uh, communities, um, destabilized our families, and really exacerbated generational trauma for far too long. And so we know it's a crisis that disproportionately impacts uh, low-income folks, uh, the most marginalized communities, uh, Black, Hispanic, LGBTQ, disabled, and it's really the result of generations of policy violence. And so as a lawmaker, um, I think we have an opportunity and a responsibility to, to do something about this. And so with over 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States, that's more per capita than any other nation in the world, this is an issue that is a uh, also personal for me. I am the child of a formerly incarcerated uh, parent. I'm certainly a no anomaly. We all have incarcerated loved ones. That speaks to just how precise and, and systematic the targeting has been um, on, on our loved ones in our communities. And so if, if you know that, that mass incarceration is, is a miscarriage of justice and rooted in slavery and white supremacy, if you care about dismantling the carceral system, then you should care about clemency. You know, this is about um, the things that people espouse but don't wanna practice in terms of redemption and second chances and grace. And I even sometimes feel uncomfortable saying second chances because, you know, many folks never even had a first chance. And, you know, my father uh, was uh, victimized by this uh, policy violence resulting in his incarceration because he was battling a substance use disorder and his disease was criminalized. Um, and so, um, you know, that was very destabilizing uh, for our household because he wasn't physically present during my formative years. And if he was granted clemency and had been released from the throes of prison, I have no idea what um, traumas and things might not have uh, found me, you know, yeah. so, but instead the system met him with criminalization and incarceration. And so as a child, I was forced to carry that burden. As Angela Davis reminds us, people think social problems go to jail, but human beings do, right? So again, my story is, is not an anomaly and there's no excuse for this problem. It's a problem that we've created, but there is a solution and clemency is a part of that solution. So the president of the United States has the power to grant clemency, either with pardons or commutations to people who are incarcerated and have a criminal record. So yes. this is a tool to reduce, again, if you care about dismantling the carceral state, disrupting mass incarceration, this is a tool to reduce the federal prison population and to reunite fam uh, families with their loved ones. Uh, to date, President Biden has granted clemency to more than 75 people 
which will help set these individuals and their families and communities on a pathway to healing. And so these actions, they, they give us hope. Um, and we need hope because yeah. the backlog is 18. That's what I was going to ask. What was the backlog? 18, oh, wow. Yeah, there are 18,000 individuals with federal clemency applications pending. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the president uh, heeded our calls and was responsive to the demands of this movement. And, um, you know, we can't stop, won't stop, and we need to see this Fixed Clemency Act um, become law, this legislation that I've introduced in partnership with Representative uh, Cori Bush and Representative um, Hakeem Jeffries. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about was you initiated this bill because there has been such a backlog, right? And because while clemency was a tool, it either was broken or it wasn't being used. There was some type of log jam there that wasn't allowing people to get out. Um, how will your bill specifically unclog that pipe? Like, what does the Fixed Clemency Act do? Um, because we like the 75, but when you talk about this 18,000 backlogs, I'm sure everybody just leaned in, you know, and, and hopes that their loved ones can get in that line. But how will you actually unclog uh, this backlog? And what would that mean if it were, if it were passed? Yeah, and that 18,000 um, person backlog, again, these are, you know, our grandmothers, our, yeah. our fathers, um, our brothers, our cousins. Um, that backlog is is so infuriating. You know, these aren't, um, you know, just applications on a shelf. These are people's lives hanging in the balance and in limbo. And you know, further insult to injury uh, is the fact that many of them uh, should not have been incarcerated in the first place. And so we know the mass incarceration is one of our nation's greatest failures. It's a policy failure and it's a moral failure. And so what our bill, the Fixed Clemency Act, uh, would do. Um, is the president would still um, have the authority uh, to grant uh, clemency to determine pardons and commutations, but it, but that would come through an independent board. So what we need to do is to take this process outside of the Department of Justice because there's a prosecutorial conflict of interest. And what's happening right now is that um, one person can unilaterally hold up an application. Uh, and so what we're advocating for is that uh, the president appoint uh, nine people to an independent board outside of the Department of Justice. Um, this would include representation from various and relevant um, stakeholders and impacted parties. And uh, most of all, uh, that which I'm encouraged uh, by and want to lift up is that one of the appointees would be a formerly incarcerated person. And that was important to me because I do believe that the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power, driving and informing the policy making. Um, and so, you know, it, it's our hope that uh, by having this independent commission, it eliminates uh, the conflict, of, the inherent conflict of interest, and um, you know, we'll, we'll get people home and reunited with their loved ones. You know, I wanted to make a, a finer point on that too, because the people who are closest to the pain are closest to the solution. And we've also found they are the ones on the ground that are winning. You know, coming up after uh, your talk, we're going to be joined by two formerly incarcerated champions, Dominique Morgan and Jose Saldana. And I can speak personally that I've had a family member, a loved one, released from prison because of Jose's advocacy, because of the wow. powerful work. Uh, that's happening on the state level. So it is so encouraging. And I've even heard them say just like genius of you to say, to suggest that that should be a part of that panel. That should be a part of that decision-making because our folks who've experienced the system understand it with the level of sophistication, firsthand knowledge, intellect that the rest of uh, people who are making these decisions just don't. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's kind of you to say. And uh... I'm grateful for Jose and grateful for you, Monifa, and everyone who's a part of this. And, you know, we, we owe it. Uh, well, first of all, we are um, deserving of our families uh, being whole. Uh, there are so many ways uh, throughout the centuries where our families have been separated. And, and um, again, it's uh, just uh, multi-generational trauma. And so uh, in the name of true justice, in the name of redemption, in the name of grace, 
uh, in the name of second chances. Um, you know, we need these folks to come home. And, you know, we already have, I think, some 600,000 people that are returning citizens returning from prison every year. And so that's also why it was just important to me that they're a part of this policymaking process, because that's what democracy is truly about. Yeah, that's what democracy is about. That's what power building and our organizing is all about, right? Centering people who are most impacted. And some of the pushback that we get in the movement for Black Lives, and I'm sure you get it too, is that when we fight to end mass incarceration and we fight against criminalization, people think that we don't care about safe communities, right? Or that we, we you know, we, we, we're just kind of being uh, Pollyannish and we don't want our, our families to be able to get to and from work safely and, and to make sure we're not robbed and all of these other things and throwing out a lot of these crime statistics in order to really kill this advocacy that we're trying to achieve, um, especially coming out of like the, the powerful uh, last few years and really last decade. What do you say um, to folks that come at you like that? We get that all the time that, that somehow we don't care about safety. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think um, safety begins with health and, you know, what makes for um, the healthiest of ecosystems and communities where people can thrive and, and not merely survive um, and then be forced to, to do things for survival and those things be criminalized. I mean, you know, I think that's really what is at, at the center of this debate. Our communities have been, again, victimized by uh, decades of policy violence, by um, divestment of, of resources, um, by under our resourcing. Um, so, you know, our communities have not been invested in. And so that does not support the health of community and an ecosystem whereby everyone um, can thrive. So, so for me, public safety begins with uh, the health of the individual, the family and, and the community. You know, as an example, um, we know that our children are carrying so much trauma in their emotional backpacks as they enter into learning communities every day. And that was true even before the pandemic. Um, but I fear that the second pandemic will be childhood trauma because trauma is any disruptive life event. And so a pandemic, food insecurity, displacement, being unhoused, um, fear of deportation, um, exposure to uh, community-based violence, gun violence, domestic violence, all things our children are dealing with. And we know that it, when we invest in their holistic health, that not only are they more functioning um, and can bring to bear their contributions, but they have a readiness to learn. So if, we, if the data supports that, then why over the last two decades would we invest $1 billion in growing our school police to 46,000 strong when 90% of our children cannot access a school nurse, a social worker, or a guidance counselor? All things that have been proven to support our children in their behavioral and mental health, in their readiness to learn. So I think that's just one example. Yeah. yeah. It's a, and it's a huge example because throughout your work, uh, we've seen this connection of promoting health is promoting safety. That when people are healthy, physically healthy, mentally healthy, that that makes for safer communities, stable families. You know, um, even here where I'm from in New York, we find that people who are formerly incarcerated lead on, you know, violence prevention programs throughout our communities. So it's like stabilizing the community and you're bringing back experts who can help you fight violence, right? Can help you interrupt that violence because of their lived experience. And um, we're going and to- And also we can't our... criminalize, only not, can we, should we not criminalize disease? You know, how are you criminalizing survival? So like, you yes. know, trans, transit is, is an example of something that's key in every way, right? It's at the intersection of everything. So why are we criminalize people for jumping a turnstile when they're, right. when they're, when they're trying to get on the train to get to school or work or childcare or a healthcare appointment. Or healthcare. <laughs> if they don't have it, 
they don't have it. And so we have to address in, invest in public transit as the public good that it is. But I just offer that as, you know, again, if there's such a um, an overlay and an interconnectedness of all of these of all of these issues. And yeah, it's, it's so blatant right there. And then you have five. We just had a viral video here in New York, right? You've got six armed police officers holding down a kid that jumped a turnstile is two dollars and seventy five cents. And when you're watching the salaries, the equipment, you know, the, the resources that are invested in criminalizing someone who is trying to survive, who's trying to get to and from, like you said, wherever they are trying to get to and from, it's an imbalance. It's like, what do you want? But I wanted to point out something very powerful that you did because I, our, one of our upcoming guests talked about also fighting for the health of people who are already incarcerated. So you helped to lead uh, a, a letter to governors throughout the Northeast when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. that we have vulnerable people who are in prison, That's our true. elders who have comorbidities, because if you've been in prison for decades, your health is also has decreased. And that we didn't want our prisons to become the super spreaders. We didn't want our prisons to become actually the, the, uh, the Petri dish that funnel of the pandemic back out into our communities. Sure. I wanted you to touch on that because our upcoming guests were really moved by that. Oh, wow. Well, I'm just so heartened that anyone is even, you know, paying attention because um, there, there's so much, um, so much need and so much work that is happening. Um, but yes, as we saw different plans being rolled out for how to stop the spread of COVID-19 in congregant settings, everything from, from nursing homes to, um, homeless shelters, mm -hmm. I, I thought it, you know, important. Dormitories, university, dormitories, everything. Right, that, that we ensure um, that our constituents who are behind the wall, our, our loved ones, our community members, uh, we still are accountable to them. And I don't think that being incarcerated should be a death sentence. And we know because of so much the other work that we have done around oftentimes the, the inhumane uh, conditions uh, behind the wall, that this would be an environment where a virus like this could really thrive um, and where people would not have, uh, would, would be unable to, to distance. Um, you know, right. to None of the CDC recommendations support. can be done in prison. Right, not, not any of it. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's no, you can't have hand sanitizer because that often is based with uh, alcohol, alcohol. And, and you can't have that, right? So um, they were at such a disadvantage inherently. And again, being incarcerated should not be a death sentence. And, um, you know, speaking of ecosystems, we knew that this was an ecosystem, um, our prisons and, and our jails where a virus like this could thrive and threaten people's lives. And so uh, we were advocating for compassionate release for, I mean, 10% of those that are incarcerated are elderly with underlying or pre-existing conditions. Um, you know, I can't believe that I have to advocate for uh, pregnant women to be released from prison. Um, they should not be incarcerated at all. Um, one of the bills that I introduced in the Momnibus um, under the uh, Black Maternal Health Caucus was justice for incarcerated moms. And I couldn't believe that I even had to have a bill with this title and that I'm having to legislate, do not shackle uh, women People in labor while they are in labor you know mm -hmm. that we have to legislate humanity um with such precision and then the, the thing that's so frustrating Monique, is that it takes longer to undo the harm than it did to advance it you know so yeah. th those those bills move quickly <laughs> those laws move quickly but when you're looking to do you know harm reduction and chart a different path um it takes much longer. And so um, that's why I have to look to uh, what happened, um, the success of our advocacy collectively resulting in those 75 people being granted clemency. Um, also, I've met numerous people who did come home because of the compassion release that, uh, that we advocated for. Um, and then also, uh, because of that advocacy, we did see uh, our governor, but others that prioritized incarcerated uh, men and women uh, for vac vaccines. 
uh, yes. when they were first made available. And that was something that, again, we fought for as they were prioritizing congregant settings that were more vulnerable to spread you know, of the virus. So, you know, there are so many other victories that Moving for Black Lives um, can take credit for. Uh, and I do think, again, it's important in the storytelling and, and both to, to fortify and embolden the broader movement that we know that um, we are powerful and, and we are having an impact because, you know, someone was saying uh, the other day in a conversation with me that people talk about us being impatient. And, um, and I was just saying that, you know, patience is, uh, is a method of the privilege. You know, we're, we're, moving, we're moving with urgency um, because we're very clear about uh, literally that this is about life and death. You can be patient when the people behind these walls and bars are nameless, faceless right. numbers. But for us, these are, these are our aunties and our grandfathers and people in our communities and our neighbors and our neighbors' uncles. And so this idea of, of patience almost becomes like insidious in a way. You know, you're going to bed every night and you know that the suffering is happening. So we're moving with urgency. And we are so grateful that you're moving with that same level of urgency. And I really am happy that we talked about the other bills that are kind of connected to fixed clemency, because I want everyone out there listening to know that this is just one lever, right? We are pushing on all cylinders, right? Sure. To weaken mass incarceration. It's never gonna be just one bill, right? It's never gonna be one executive order. It's gonna have to be us moving on the local and state level because most people are incarcerated in the states. It's gonna to have to be us moving on the federal level, right? To change the conversation and to make sure there's movement on these federal prisoners. Um, but it's, it, and it's everyone out there, you, everyone who's listening, your ideas, joining in, helping to push these bills. I really want you to talk about how people can support fixed clemency. So what can people do? We have 150 Black-led organizations that are part of our Movement for Black Lives ecosystem. And so many people out here watching that, I know right now, like, how can I get involved? How can I support Fix Clemency? How can I just support everything that Sister Ayanna Presley is doing? How can people join you? Yeah, thank I appreciate that, that question very much because, um, again, ultimately, movement building is about organizing. And so, um, what folks can do from home. There are three things that you can do to help to make the Fixed Clemency Act a reality. So first, something that every person can do right now is to help to uh, broaden and build this coalition by telling a friend about the bill and educating them about the about the issue. Um, you know, Monifa, you were talking about the many, how we're, we're seeking uh, every lever that we can exact, that we can pull um, in the movement for black lives. And so sometimes that's gonna be about something we create and other times it's about what already exists and how do we get folks to, to leverage that and hold them accountable. The clemency power already exists, right? Um, but, but we need to just reshape in that in a way that it will be uh, transparent and, um, and fair and where we will not have like the 18,000 uh, person backlog that we do currently, people's lives hanging in the balance. So we, we first and foremost, we need your help to educate people on the issue of clemency, to help us to build and broaden this coalition by telling a friend about the bill and about the issue. You can post about it on social media. Uh, you can use the hashtag fix clemency. You can share this teach in, uh, share these videos or direct folks to the website at fixclemencyact.org. Uh, secondly, if you want to see the Fixed Clemency Act become law, tell your member of Congress. Never assume um, that uh, they are where you are. Um, and even if you could assume that they would likely not be on the, on the same side, um, still make the call. You know, they are accountable to you and you should call them and urge them to be a co-sponsor of my Fixed Clemency Bill uh, with Representative Hakeem Jeffries and Representative Cori Bush. And then finally, uh, to move legislation towards a vote, uh, first we have to have a committee hearing in Congress. And that means you can reach out directly to the Judiciary Committee. And you can do that by phone, uh, you can do it by social media or email and ask them to hold a hearing. 
you know, explain to them why you want a fair and equitable process to reduce the prison population and to help in this crisis of mass incarceration. So those are, those are three things um, that you can do to help the Fixed Clemency Act become law. And, um, and then I would also encourage you, uh, you needn't just enlist federal partners. Monifa, just as one example, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts just yesterday, we, they passed a bill to make um, phone calls free. And that was a part of a broader bill um, that we've been advancing here uh, in Washington, slowly but surely, the People's Justice Guarantee. And, and again, having had an incarcerated uh, parent, those phone calls are, are a lifeline. And because of this for-profit system, they're often uh, cost prohibitive. And so if that's disrupting your ability to remain connected to family, that affects your mental health. But if you're fortunate enough to be released and to return to community uh, and family, this helps to strengthen the bonds of family reunification, which breaks the cycle of recidivism, you know? So I just lift that. I know we're here to talk about fixed clemency, yes. uh, but Monifa said we could also, you know, talk about other issues that are connected, but I wanted to, again, lift up a victory, you know? So that's an example of there being federal legislation. It isn't moving as quickly as we would like, but our partners on the state level, because of the strength of this broader movement, were able to get that done. And coming up next, we're going to hear about more state level victories. Okay. And this is, like you said, all connected, you know, and tell your stories, everyone, you know, definitely support fixed clemency, tell a friend, make sure your member of Congress is a co-sponsor, you know, get involved. But like we said earlier, for a lot of the people that are decision makers, it is nameless, faceless statistics, but we're going to put faces to it. We're going to put names to it. We're going to tell our stories. And when our folks get out, a lot of them who are released become champions to dismantle mass incarceration. So that's coming up next. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Thank you for joining us. Thank you Thank for all of your work and come again. You got that. Come on. Anytime to be any, anytime I can be with family. So yeah, we're going to celebrate. We have that hearing because we will have a fixed clemency act hearing. We will celebrate. Okay, Thank well, you so much. He was manifesting it. Okay. All yes. right. Thank you, everyone. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much. And welcome, everyone, for joining us this evening for this powerful teaching about fixed clemency, which is a, a national issue and also something that people are driving on the state and community level across the country. I'm so happy to be here right now joining our next panelist, our next expert, who's been working to dismantle mass incarceration and free our elders um, for as long as I've known for the past decade. But particularly, Jose Saldano is the director of RAP, Releasing Aging People in Prisoner, Prison Campaign. And RAP is a grassroots community organizing and advocacy campaign co-founded by a collective of formerly incarcerated people. And I wanna tell y'all, this collective of folks are doing powerful work all across New York State. RAP works to end mass incarceration and promote racial justice through the release of older people in prison and those serving long-term prison sentences as a means of uprooting greater forces of forces of injustice that uphold legacies of racism, revenge, and perpetual punishment that basically controls Black and other communities of color. Um, Jose is also formerly incarcerated. He was released from state prison in January of 2018, not long ago, and already championing amazing work, doing a total of 38 years incarcerated. And during those decades of incarceration, Jose had obtained a college degree. More importantly, he committed himself to advocating for revolutionary solutions to the social and economic conditions of the people in our community and around the country. And it's really what has led him to this work here today. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Jose, for being with us today. Um, first, tell us a little bit about RAP. What is its mission and what are you currently doing? Yes, uh, thank you for having me. It's us. I am super honored being here. Uh, as you mentioned, rap had you know rap was founded with the vision of ending mass incarceration, and, and what that means is that you know we promote legislative initiatives that will hit right on 
the carceral system. It goes toward decarcerating. And, and we choose to advocate for the older people because those are the people who have languished in prison for three or four decades. And there have been scholars, pioneers, and mentors to multi younger generations during three and four decades. So we feel that they should have the opportunity to return back to their families and home communities. And we know that they could be an asset to their communities. I'm one of those elders. I didn't start out elder, but I'm one of those elders. As you said, I was released uh, after 38 years. I was released when I was 66 years old. Mm -hmm. and, and and I do this work because I left behind men who should have been released right with me, walking out the prison with me, and some of them should have really been released long before me. Unfortunately, some of my mentors have already passed away. And that's what we want to stop is death by incarceration. We you know we look at that in this community as another death penalty, right? That. There's execution, but then there's also keeping someone in prison until they pass away. But rap has had tremendous success already. Can you talk about some of the wins that you've had and some of the campaigns that you are currently advancing that really has led to the release of some people already? Absolutely. We, we actually educated the senators who confirm parole commissioners. The governor appoints them, the Senate confirms them. And we educated them to the process of parole and what parole is it was intended to be. It wasn't intended to be another body to resentence people. In some cases, they have been resentenced to double what the court sentenced them as a minimum term. So, and, and, and because of our educating the, the, the New, York, uh, New York State Senate, they have actually been more involved in confirming or not confirming some of the governor's appointees. Mm -hmm. And we also educated the parole commissioners in this process. And this, and because we made parole a common, a, pro, a common uh, subject in our communities. And because of this, this has led to more people. In fact, when RAP was founded, uh, the release rate of the New York State parole was 26. It mm -hmm. doubled, it doubled in just three or four years. Now it's in the, in the 40s. And that's not good enough because people are still languishing in prison, being resentenced, like you said, to death by incarceration sentence. And, and, and what, what it is, is that harshest sentence is at the beginning to black and brown people for the most part. And then the parole board being complicit in the policies of mass incarceration, denying parole in between men and women are just getting old, sick and dying. So this is the crisis that we have to address. Absolutely. And, you know, just to, to put a fine note on it, what is happening in New York State and around the country is that people are getting sentences like 10 years with parole, 15 years with parole, right? 25 years with the possibility of parole. But then when they come before the parole board, instead of looking at those measures that the parole board is supposed to look at, which is the time that someone has served, they continue to go back to the original offense and add years on. So the 25 year sentence turns into a 50 year sentence. The 15 year sentence turns into a 45 year sentence. And the parole board was not, they're not judge, you know, they're not jury. They weren't supposed to extend these sentences. And because of the education that you did and that rap did, even some of my own family have come home because it forced the parole board to look very strictly at what they're supposed to take into consideration to release someone on parole. And I know a lot of folks out there listening, of course, listen, we're, you know, I'm an abolitionist and we wanna tear down all the means of in mass incarceration. This important work that RAP is doing is weakening the carceral state in a way that allows us to then do the next thing. So we can continue to open the doors and open more cages and open more doors and open more cages. And so, how important is it that this work is led by people who are formerly incarcerated and really understand how these systems work? Because people like me who, who you know, and I'm not alone, there, there are many of us out here who have been fortunate enough to make it, but uh, after the literally years and sometimes decades of being denied parole. But we see what the system is. We see the, the injustice of the system. I, I, one of my mentors, 
you know, this guy, in fact, this guy was my first mentor. He died at 73 years old after being incarcerated for 48 years. And he died at his 14th parole hearing. Mm. During the hearing, he had a massive stroke and passed away. And, and, and this is the injustice that I see and a lot of us who are formerly incarcerated, we don't only see the injustice of the parole board, of the harshest sentences, mostly given out to black and brown people, but the brutality of the system, the brutal murders in, in, in New York State correctional facilities by white guards and white guards who are over racist and overly a part of racist gangs. So we see that this system at its worst in the eye of the storm. So we are better equipped than anybody else to fight, not only to abolish the system, to, to eradicate it entirely, leave nothing behind, but we know that that is in the future. We have to build an abolitionist movement in the future. But for now, we have to, we have to work towards decarcerating, getting as many as black and brown mothers, fathers, grandparents back to their families back into their communities. And we do this through advocating for the elder parole bill, which provides that a person that served 15 years has, is 55 years old, will go to a parole board. Hmm. Norm, some people have no hope of going to a parole board. 15 years is more than enough time. 55 years, people are dying in New York State prison at 58 and 57 years old. 55 is giving them enough time more years into their life where they can go out and repair harm in their communities. And then the next bill, the Fair and Tiny Parole Bill, which provides that the parole board can no longer measure whether we're at risk to public safety based on a crime that was committed in some cases for 45 years ago. They have to measure a person's suitability for parole by what he's done during the years of incarceration and who she or he is today. These two bills will go a long way toward decarceration. And I'm going to talk about how this connects to our larger discussion around clemency, because, you know, the way the parole board in New York State and in other states is functioning is preventing people from getting out the same way clemency has been backlogged, you know, for, for, for years and years with thousands of people um, backlogged in that system. But uh, before I touch on that, I just want you to talk about a little bit about the momentum around the two bills that you named because you just had an advocacy day um, this week where people from all over the state were in Albany. Um, how was that? What is the energy? How is the momentum moved? I know I attended an advocacy day that happened right before the pandemic, also in Albany, and I was inspired because there were hundreds of us in the hall marching with our elders who had been released and with family members of folks who were still out. What was it like this, this week in Albany? It, it was amazing. We collaborated. In fact, we called our advocacy day parole justice and survival justice mm -hmm. because we understand there is no binary between those who committed crimes and those who have been the victims of crime. In fact, for the most part, especially in women prisons, they are 90% of the women in prison are survivors of some, some type of violence, That's right. it's not sexual, it's interpersonal violence. And, and, and with the men, we are also survivors. So we collaborated with the biggest uh, survivor organization in the state of New York. The biggest one, uh, mothers who lost children, mothers who lost children are collaborating with us, supporting our movement wow. for parole justice, because they realize that when a person, uh, a mother loses a life, another mother loses a son or a daughter. And more than likely it's a black mother or a brown mother that's also gonna lose a son or daughter to the prison system. So they yeah. realize, man, that there is no justice in perpetual punishment. There's no justice in revenge. Justice is in healing. And they realize that, right. and, and the thing is, during the years of my incarceration, the New York State Department of Correction has never offered us a program a therapeutic program for us to develop insight into the harm that we wow. did. The harm, imagine that, 25 years in prison, 35 years, 45 years, and not a single program, but we developed these programs because not only do we have developed insight into the harm that we committed, but 
these programs help us embrace as a moral obligation to come back, if we get back to societies, to come back and help our communities heal, help families in our communities heal. And they understand that. And we understand that ahead of the state, ahead of you know people who are officials over public health and so-called rehabilitation programs. And so that is so powerful for those mothers to unite with advocates that are pushing to release elders. That's the type of movement that is coming together, y'all, all over the country. What we see happening in New York and happening in the Midwest and the South and the West Coast is that people are understanding that criminalization, policing, incarceration doesn't make our community safe. It doesn't make our communities healthy. It doesn't make our communities whole. Our folks know what makes our community safe. Those mothers who join forces with RAP know what will make their communities safe, and we need to listen to that. How would Sister um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley's uh, Fixed Clemency Act, how would it impact people in New York State? That is a great question. I, I, read, I, read, I read the act, the Fixed, act for, Fixed Clemency Act for the very mm -hmm. first time, uh, just a, a week ago. Uh, I knew about it, but I think it didn't apply to us. So this was uh, my, my, my bad because I should have actually looked into it. But after reading it, I, I actually envisioned this as a model. Mm -hmm. not, not just a model for the states, but in particular, a model for us in New York. Because if, if we look at the elder parole bill, it's clemency. We're asking That's for right. legislative clemency. And, and we do have a clemency campaign. Our clemency campaign, we, we will definitely work on redesigning it so that it can model the, the fixed clemency act. Because the idea of having an incarcerated person on that board, that is amazing. That's right. An impacted person, you know, that is amazing. Not only would it be a model for the clemency process across the state, particularly in New York State, but it is also a model for the parole board. Mm -hmm. You know, two yeah. release mechanisms that we work on. We work on now parole releases and clemency releases. So these two mechanisms can actually be modeled by the Fifth Clemency Act. Absolutely. I mean, it would be such a great model to have on the state level, um, even as it's being pushed to be achieved on the federal level. You know, like you said, we can take it now and try to model it, even though we're also still trying to push it on the federal level. And when I think about state clemency, um, what comes to mind is that they also work together, right? Because a lot of times in New York state, if the governor gives you clemency, what that does is bring you before the parole board, right? right? And if parole is broken, you know, you got to fix clemency and fix parole. Like the things have to work in tandem so that we can start to see our folks uh, come back home, especially people who have served long sentences. And, and I just want to say that, you know, the folks out there, this work is very important because the moderates out there want to focus on what they consider to be the poster child for um, folks who are incarcerated, who are in prison, people who have offenses that are quote unquote nonviolent, people who have offenses that are not linked to a tragedy. A lot of times people who have uh, sentences that are long, but not based, not based in anything that is connected to, to violence, to harm in our communities, which Jose has talked about, the need for folks to come back and do some of that repair work who have committed those harms. And so the way that rap moves on the state level to say, we won't separate violent offenders from nonviolent offenders when we push for parole to be fixed or for people to be released because COVID, you know, all the things that you all have worked on, how important is it to make sure we don't allow that to be separated in that way? It, it is a fundamental uh, principle for us not to exclude people from parole justice. We say parole justice is racial justice and racial justice is human justice. So we do not exclude anybody based on the crime of conviction or the length of sentence. And this is something that a lot of our electors have a problem with. And the reason why this is a fundamental principle with us because we tie our movement for justice, racial justice in New York State 
to the movement for social and racial justice in the past. And even the movement for civil justice, civil rights, and nowhere in our history of fighting for liberation, equality, and justice in this country, nowhere have people been excluded. Nowhere. We will not replicate a system that excludes people. So we say parole justice is for everyone because mass incarceration took us all in. Mass incarceration did not exclude any one of us. We were all subject to the racist policies of mass incarceration. And again, our movement is as in the history of liberation struggles across this country. And we say racial justice is for everyone and no one will be excluded from our movement for justice. No one will be excluded from the opportunity to return back to their families, return back to their communities and help revitalize and rebuild their, their communities. I got an email recently that was from RAP that said, we leave no one behind, leave no one behind. Uh, and it was just so moving um, because I look at a lot of times how in our movement, we make that mistake of separating, you know, well, we'll do this for the folks that are likable or whatever. But when we move as a whole, it's really more powerful. So thank you so much for that work. Um, I wanted to stress that uh, RAP is a powerful member of the Movement for Black Lives. We are 150 Black-led organizations across the country. RAP is also in leadership of a Black-led coalition in New York State called the Black Freedom Project. And so just like the clemency, Fix Clemency Act will be a great model for folks on the, on the state level trying to fix clemency, people in the state are designing campaigns to release our folks from cages that can also be models for folks in other states. So please follow Jose Saldana, please follow RAP in the work that they are doing. We're gonna drop some links in the chat where you can take action and find out more about parole justice and their two priority bills for this year. And is there anything else that you wanted to say, um, Jose, before we sign off? Yes, I, I, I would just like to have all our listeners to log in to RAP's website. That's rappcampaign.com. You get all the information, our upcoming event. We have an upcoming event on May the 10th. After old justice, it's elder justice. So this is a, in May is older American day. So we always have the theme of the month. And, and I, there's one thing uh, uh, in particular that we would definitely like to uh, uh, collaborate in some form with, with the assembly members that are supporting this Fisk Clemency Act. In some form of fashion, we can collaborate to, to, to make parole justice and clemency justice uh, a reality in New York State. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I want to point out for folks that the Congresswoman Ayanna Presley that we spoke with earlier um, has collaborated with RAP, you know, has collaborated mm -hmm. on advocacy with organizations in states all over the Northeast, you know, helping to put together a letter, uh, I believe it was last year to state right. governors, um, especially in the wake of COVID to say, not only should we be releasing our elders in prison, but given what we know about COVID-19, being incarcerated, being a certain age, having comorbidities, they are at a higher risk of mortality to, to have our, our elders in these cages where they cannot um, social distance or do any of the things that the Center for Disease Control was recommending at that time. So for everyone listening, you know, our advocates um, in the states and locally are collaborating with folks on the Hill in very powerful ways that are helping to not only free our families, but also keep our families safe while they're incarcerated. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you. If you want to get involved and stay involved with the Fixed Clemency Act, go to fixclemencyact.org. That's fixclemencyact.org to find out how to take action, to find out how to support many of the advocates and families around the country, as well as our champions on Capitol Hill, like Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Unfortunately, Dominique Morgan could not make our panel today, but we are so appreciative of her leadership and her powerful work amongst communities of people who have been directly impacted by the carceral state and their families. Thank you everyone for tuning in to our Fixed Clemency Act Teach In.
reach back out to us. Let us know about the work that you're doing in your community, in your school, with your church, at your workers union. This is all connected to the BREATHE framework, which is about investing in our communities through public health, through education, housing, healthcare, and really dismantling and divesting from the carceral state. We know that there are so many of us out there doing this work. If you specifically wanna help the Fix Clemency Act, go straight to the website, fixclemencyact.org backslash take action. And it's gonna give you so many ways that you can plug yourself in, your friends, your family, cause it's gonna take all of us. But there's three very specific things that we want you to know as you leave today. One is we want you to tell a friend, spread the word, build community around this bill. A lot of us carry shame around the fact that we have incarcerated loved ones or that we've been incarcerated. But now's the time for us to break that silence, talk about the Fixed Clemency Act, talk about how it impacts you personally or how it impacts your family or community, and let's build movement. The second piece is that we need more co-sponsors. We need you to reach out to your member of Congress, your representative in Congress, the US Senator in your state and tell them that you want them on board to fix clemency. We want them to be a co-sponsor of the Fixed Clemency Act. Tell them we want them to trust black women, follow black women and follow Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and join her in helping to unclog the system around clemency. And finally, we really need to make sure that the House Judiciary Committee has a hearing for Cle Fixed Clemency Act, right? Any bill before it gets to the door where we know it's gonna become law has to have a hearing. So put pressure on members of the Judiciary Committee to have a hearing on the Fixed Clemency Act. Get involved in that hearing if you have a story or if your organization works on this issue or something similar so that we can make the most powerful case possible. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned for more teach-ins of other components of the BREATHE campaign as we fight for abolition.